Hey everybody and welcome to True Crime Paranormal with the Psychic Sisters. This is Katie Weaver and I'm here with my co-host and partner in crime, Christy Brower. Hello. Hello. It's the start of the week. Yes, it is. I'm good. We're coming in hot. Yes. (laughs) And down the deep rabbit hole while the snow is piling up outside. Mm. Yeah. Hit pretty hard. Yeah, our weather sucks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's okay, because it really it's great research. Uh, it's great research weather. It is. It is. I. My latest issue is I, I keep falling down the rabbit hole of one case that leads me to another, to another, and I don't finish anything. So I'm having to, like, <laughs> discipline myself, like, get your shit together. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, you know, that's just exciting because uh, we know there will never be a shortage of cases. No, we will never run out, which is cool. No, no. Cool and sad, I guess, because if we never run out, it means that crime never stops happening. Yeah, but there's so much old crime. You could do old crime and never dip a toe into anything else if you wanted to, you know. It's so true. It's so true. And there's so many old interesting cases, too. Oh, yeah. And then, of course, so much of the current stuff, you know. So, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, if you guys aren't um, on our Patreon, you might want to go uh, check mm-hmm. that out because we did do a case on the disappearance of Agatha Christie. Yes. Disappearance and reappearance of Agatha Christie. We did that <laughs> last week for our patrons. And we're doing a lot of fun cases over there. That's all extra content. So Mm -hmm. if you join and help support us, then you get bonus cases. And that Agatha Christie one was a really interesting one. I Mm -hmm. loved it. Yes, it was. It was awesome. Love her. Love her. Yep. Well, I've got a very interesting case for us today as well. Um, this is the kind of case that normally I would present to Christy as a cold read. It's not necessarily a cold read because we know who the culprit is, but I'm just going to ask you after I present this case to give me a reading on this human. For sure. So we are talking about just about him as a person. So we are talking about Ferdinand Waldo Demera. This guy okay. was an impersonator. In his lifetime, he impersonated being a teacher, a psychologist, an editor, a surgeon, a monk, an engineer, as well as a few other things, a prison warden and a few other things. A surgeon? Oh, yeah. I'll get there. Oh, holy crap. I'll uh, get there. That's terrifying. Mm-hmm. He was quite the guy. And... This all started when he was 16 years old. When he was 16, he was sick of school. Now, it's interesting because some of the articles I have read say that he was extremely intelligent. Some of the articles I read say he wasn't. I think, yes, he was. Mm -hmm. Uh, It appears that he had a photographic memory. So by the time he was 16 in school, he was bored to pieces. He was born in 1920, and by the time... uh, the mid thirties rolled around. He was sick to death of school board, just didn't like it anymore. So he ran away, decided he wanted to become a monk. So he, yeah, what he wanted to do, all of the things he wanted to do, he didn't want to put in the time to become that thing. It was too boring for him. Right. So what he really wanted to do was be a priest or a military officer. But he didn't want to have to go to school or, you know, go through all the paces to become that. So then he decided to become, of all things, a silent order, join a silent order of Trappist monks. So when he's 16, he runs away from his home in Lawrence, Massachusetts, and lies to the monks and tells them that he is old enough. And they let him join. Well, his parents are frantic and finally find him. Can you imagine this? Your 16-year-old runs away. You cannot find the kid. You finally track him down. He is living in a silent order of monks pretending to be old enough to be there. I mean, what? Yeah, right. right. Of all things, why that? Why that? Okay. Right. That's giving so, me something to work on. 
the monks are like, well, I mean, I guess you can stay. And his parents are like, have at it. So <laughs> they leave him there and he becomes a monk. He lives there for two years and they get tired of him uh, not following the rules. So they decide that he doesn't have the right temperament and ask him to leave. So he did gain his hood and habit, however, while he was there. But uh, basically, I'm guessing he couldn't keep his mouth shut. But that's just my thought. <laughs> but yeah. he ends up leaving. So after he leaves there, he tries to join another, a few other orders. He tries to join the Brother of Charity uh, Children's Home in Westbury, Massachusetts. But again, he's not very, there very long, isn't following the rules, and they ask him to leave. So he responds to that by stealing money and a car from them and heading off into the sunset and joining the army in 1941 at age 19. But he did not like military life. He did not like having to uh, follow the structure and the rules there either. And so he stole a friend's identity and fled. So he went AWOL from the army and joined the Navy with someone else's name. The name of a friend of his. Oh boy. So while he's in the Navy, he gets accepted for medical training. He passes the basic courses, but you know, he dropped out of high school. He doesn't really have all of the uh, education needed to keep going. So they don't allow him to go on. So he really wants to get into the medical school. So he creates a, a fake set of documents indicating that he already had the college qual qualifications to keep going. Oh my gosh. But he actually did such a great job on those documents that he decided that he didn't really need to apply to medical school. He really uh, wanted to just uh, fake papers to become an officer instead. So he did that and he was accepted as a naval officer for a minute. When he was discovered, he faked his own suicide and went on the run again. Wow. So, and of course, he's just jumping from one name to the next. Mm -hmm. So in 1942, he takes on the identity of Dr. Robert Linton French, who is a former naval officer and psychologist. He found his details in an old college prospectus uh, where he had profiled French when he worked there and he just took on his name and he started working at a college teaching psychology. So <laughs> seriously, like you cannot make this up, you know? Right. And this is all pre-internet, which is the only reason he got away uh -huh. with any of this. Yep. So he teaches psychology at this college for three years. Within that time, he actually Whoa. encourages the college to expand to a university, and they are considering him to as the chancellor <laughs> because uh, it is with his help and expertise that they've managed to expand to this uh, higher uh, these higher goals. Wow! But eventually, they pass him over for the chancellorship. Uh, you know, and the thought here is that had he become the chancellor. Nobody would have ever looked into his uh, credentials. He would have been the top guy in charge. And right. he could have been there for a long time. Well, yeah. Just, once he legitimately had that job, who's ever going to look yeah. into him again? Yeah. So finally, in 1945, he is caught uh, as the fraud he is there. And his real name comes to light. And the authorities go, oh, well, we've been looking for him because he deserted from the army. So way back when he deserted the army when he was 19, it's now coming back to bite it about mm -hmm. 10 years later. So oh, wow. he's supposed to serve a six-year sentence, but they release him after 18 months on good behavior. I mean, you can see how his charisma yeah. just keeps winning him more and more, uh, you know, opportunities. He mm -hmm. just keeps charming the pants off people and, uh, you know, it just keeps working. So after 18 months, he gets released. 
and he creates a new identity, big surprise, by the name of Cecil Heyman, and he enrolls at Northeastern University. So he was trying to complete a law degree, but he got tired of it. It got boring. So he awarded himself a PhD and took the persona of Dr. Cecil Heyman and took up another teaching post at a Christian college called the Brothers of Christian Instruction in Maine in the summer of 1950. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, he's just tearing it up. Can you, I mean, okay. It just makes me like, Think about, can you imagine just looking back into your own past, your own teachers, yeah, your own doctors, <laughs> your, uh, right, your, the, yeah. o- your own professionals uh, in your life that you've Surgeons, with. holy crap. Mm-hmm. Thinking about what if they had been imposters, right? Okay. Right. So he teaches at this college for a while and he makes friends with a doctor from Canada named Joseph Sear. And Joseph had moved to the U.S. to set up his medical practice. He needed some help with immigration paperwork. And our dear friend here was happy to oblige. And because of that, Dr. Sear had given him all of his identifying documents. So Damara fills out all of his paperwork with him, helps him out, and of course helps himself to his identity. Yeah. So after, uh, you know, Dr. Sear moves down into the U.S. and starts opens his practice. He takes his uh, documentation and becomes Dr. Sear and moves to Canada and decides that he wants to go back to the military. So he goes to the Canadian Navy and says, make me an offer or I'm going to go to the Army. Well, the Canadian Navy, uh, Military at the time was in desperate need of good doctors, and there's no way the Navy was going to let him go to the Army. So they make him an officer and put him on a naval base, and he is a doctor there. My gosh. He convinces other doctors while he's there to contribute to a medical booklet that he claimed to be producing for lumberjacks living in remote parts of Canada. (laughs) <laughs> and so they all turn over all of this knowledge to him and they're partnering with him and sharing all of this expertise with them. And he's using that to know what to do to take care of patients. <laughs> so he was building his own how-to manual. Yep. Yep. I'm so, very curious why lumberjacks needed that medical handbook. <laughs> I. It's a good question. That's hilarious. But it it works because, again, he's partnering with these doctors. They're sharing their expertise. They're friends. They're honored because he's asking them. And so his bullshit is working yet again. And he does have familiarity with being in in the Navy or in the military. And that's kind of, you know, working out for him. So in 1951, he's transferred to be a ship doctor on a destroyer, the HMCS Cayuga. Cayuga. (laughs) They're stationed off the coast of Korea. So he had a sick birth attendant who he was basically letting do all medical things. Mm -hmm. So like a a medical assistant, right? And he was doing all of that in the uh, spirit of He's doing a great job. I want him to have this experience. I want him to be able to, you know, spread his wings. The medical attendant loves him because he's just right. staying out of his way and letting him be the ship doctor, you know, right. and a- occasionally offering an opinion, you know, but he's just kind of, <laughs> he's just, oh my gosh, along for the ride. But again, the med staff all love him because he's very supportive. He's very uh, complimentary. He's letting them do their thing. And he's just the uh, the good guy doctor in charge. So then something happens that uh, pushes him even. So three Korean refugees end up on their ship in need of medical attention. And he, they all need like, serious treatment, surgery, Mm -hmm. and using uh, the med assistant, letting him have uh, his role, and using textbooks, he manages to pull off their surgeries 
uh, the most impressive, an amputation. <gasps> oh my God. Successfully. And he didn't kill anyone? No, amputates a man's leg and he's okay. And he's recommended for a commendation for his actions, <laughs> which turns out to be his undoing because there was a picture of him in the paper and a story about what a great doctor he is and that he took these refugees and saved their lives and took care of them and managed to do an onboard amputation of this man's leg and it saved him. Well, somebody saw this article and said, that's not my son. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> so the mama of the real doctor sees this. She goes to the authorities. The Canadian government does not want the embarrassment of having to admit that they have someone practicing medicine. They don't want an international incident with uh, now that they've had, you know, he's been treating uh, people from Korea and basically they just want the whole thing to go away. So mm -hmm. they just quietly deport him back to America. So somehow though, reports of his actions make it to the press and Life Magazine buys his story, runs a huge article on him. He's like one of the only criminals to ever appear on the cover of Life magazine. And basically he's getting all of this uh, attention for being what they called the great imposter. Oh. So, <laughs> but he gets tired of being the great imposter because he can't really get a job anymore. Yeah, because really he's the great criminal. Yeah. So in 1955, he acquires the credentials of a man named Ben W. Jones and disappears again and is off to make a new life. So as Jones, he becomes, now this one slays me, like why? A guard at a prison in Huntsville, Texas. Just opportunity. I feel like he just. Yeah got the opportunity to get this guy's identity. He really didn't get to choose this time like he had before. Yeah. Probably something this man had done in the past. Although, yep. and I'll get to the psychological stuff, but one thing that's very underlying with him is he craves order. Mm -hmm. He is just so much chaos. And that's the monk, the military, multiple times military, the, yeah. you know, being guard in a prison. It's the order. Yeah. He doesn't have that inside of himself at all. And so he yep. really craves it. He can't live with it. Yeah. He can't actually follow the rules and do it, but he wants that kind of order. I feel like mm -hmm. that's where that very first started when he ran to the monks. It really makes me wonder if his parents kind of, uh, if he was a free range kid, you know, that didn't have very much structure, that didn't have very much discipline. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Or maybe the opposite, but it, yeah, I agree with you on that. So he starts working at this, uh, prison and of course makes his way right up the ranks as he always does of course because he's and, so charismatic yep pretty soon he is in charge of the maximum security wing but in is. 1956 an educational program that provides prisoners with magazines leads to the prisoners getting a hold of the life magazine article that features him <laughs> And they take the cover picture to prison officials. And he <laughs> categorically denies, this is not me. I don't know what you're talking about, right? My last name is Jones. But they decide, in fact, yes, it is Damara. And here he is yet again. And he fights really hard on this one. And, you know, is trying to prove that he's been really good for this prison. And he's done, you know, has great feedback from everybody. And there's how could they possibly do this to him? But eventually he decides to run. So he takes off. And in 1957, he's caught in North Haven, Maine, and serves a six-month prison sentence mm -hmm. for his actions. Mm -hmm. After his release, he makes several television appearances. I, he's on the game show, You Bet Your Life. Oh, wow. He makes a cameo in a horror. He's like a pop culture figure. He makes a cameo mm -hmm. in a horror film called The Hypnotic Eye. Mm -hmm. And from this point to his death in 1981, he basically can't really, he, his face is too well known now. There's no faking mm -hmm. it anymore. He eventually goes back to the church and gets ordained using his own name 
and works as a spiritual counselor at a hospital in California until he dies in 1981. Wow. Yep. So, man, what the hell, man? <laughs> right? So that is the life he had. It's just so crazy. And it, I mean, he obviously, he did get caught a few times, but, you know, like with Canada, they just went, ah, just get the hell out. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, we, don't, we don't need this to splash all over our headlines. Uh, right. It's just so crazy. Right from the beginning, which what 16-year-old runs away to join a silent uh, order of monks? Mm -hmm. So there you have it. Who is this guy? Okay, so I've got several things. First of all, he oh, has actually, a person. Actually, before we do oh. that, let's mm -hmm. take a quick commercial break. Oh, yes. And then That's I good. would love for you to evaluate our, uh, I can't say our hero, our uh, our imposter. Our, our imposter. Okay. Okay. Hi, I'm Christy Brower, podcaster and professional psychic. I have spent the last 14 years honing my skills as a psychic and a healer. I work on the Purple Ocean app. You can find it in any of the app stores. And I am available every day for video and chat readings. I specialize in pattern breaking, uh, particularly in relationships, but really in any area of your life. If you're feeling stuck and like you can't move on or you can't let something go, I am the reader for you. That is exactly what I focus on. It's what I love to do. I love to help stuck people get moving and I've been doing it for many years and have been very successful at it and can do that for you as well. So if you are having trouble letting go of a relationship or a fear or a challenge of any kind in your life, come see me at Purple Ocean and we will do everything we can, me and my guidance system and my intuition and you, because it's always a package deal that we work together, but we will find a way to break that pattern for you. So come see me over at Purple Ocean and let's break your patterns. All righty. So we are back from commercial. So Christy, what do you think of Ferdinand Waldo Damara? <laughs> okay. So a few things just um, definitely brilliant. No, no doubt about that. Very, very brilliant. I 100% I agree with the photographic memory. He was a very, very smart person. I also feel he probably had a personality disorder of some sort that really, he didn't really have an identity. It was easy for him to assume these other roles because he didn't really have an identity of his own, which is, uh, you know, a, a, a hallmark of some personality disorders. I feel like he also had ADHD or something like that. Uh -huh. where his brain ran 100 miles an hour 24-7. He didn't have any control over his thinking. And it wasn't until he was playing a role and identifying himself as someone or something that he felt normal. I also feel like he really, really craved order, as I said before, because he didn't have his own internal operating system that created order in his life. He just lacked that. Mm -hmm. And so he would reach out and seek things that gave him order. But he also really, really craved accolades and prestige. Mm -hmm. And so that's why, you know, the the teacher, you know, the, the college professor, or the doctor, or the, um, the uh, military, you know, rising up in the military, he needed those accolades. He needed people regularly to tell him who he was because he really didn't know. Yeah. And that it's most certainly uh, probably a combination of psychological disorders that yeah. he had, uh, because also he clearly had no um, moral objection to the things that he was doing. Yeah. And so there's a there's an antisocial element to this where it didn't bother him that he was lying. It didn't bother him that what he was doing could be harming people. I mean, you think about the yeah. medical stuff, the, the surgeries, holy shit, you know, he could have killed someone teaching psychology. Mm -hmm. What was he teaching those kids? You know? Right. I mean, there's, there's so much here where he could have done some serious damage, yep. but he clearly didn't care. He was very self-centered, mm -hmm. but he also just craved attention terribly. Yeah. So very much a, a, a combination of psychological disorders mm -hmm. um, mixed with high intelligence, 
and major charisma because without that charisma, he never would have got through any of those things that he got through. He 100% had the ability to talk anybody into anything. Yeah. And he was also lucky to be functioning at a time that he didn't have, we didn't have the internet where they, you know, couldn't right. make you prove this stuff. You just showed yeah. up with your documents and that's all that and there, you there was. Yep. Yeah. None of this would have ever fly. He would have actually in this day and age, he would have been some kind of catfish artist, you know, on <laughs> online, but not, you know, right. Yeah. Out in the rest of the world, because there's no way that he could get away with it. But yeah, I just, yeah. Th this sense of turmoil and this sense of he has no idea who he is. It's, so it's like he had to try out all these different identities mm -hmm. and, you know, he, his trust and belief in himself was endless to the point mm -hmm. that he was sure that he could just take on any persona and do anything. Yeah. Which is kind of enviable, except that, you know, he yeah. took it way too far. It's so wild. So there yeah. was a biography written about him by a guy named Crichton. And in the biography, he says uh, that in starting fresh committees, fresh uh, plans, like the booklet, right? And mm -hmm. in academia, he would start like a new department or a new program. He would always create for himself in whatever job he was some new niche yeah. Because he said that was expanding the power vacuum so that he wasn't stepping on anybody else's toes. He was creating a new place for himself to be so that he could be shoulder to shoulder with his colleagues, um, but not go up against them. Because yeah. that's how he felt like he would get caught versus uh, just creating his, a, a new thing within right. uh, the structure he was in. Right. Because yeah. if no one had ever done this job before, they had no reference for how it should be done. Exactly. It's very, very smart. I mean, the, the dude was very, very intelligent. Yeah. And that, boys and girls, is how self-care manuals for lumberjacks came to be. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and you know, so charismatic that he could have sold that to a group of doctors that wouldn't have what? been like, what? <laughs> what does this? this? Yeah. Lumberjacks. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's so wild. All righty. Well. Thank you very much. That is a fun story, I think, and it just is. a thought-provoking one when you look back into, uh, again, thinking about my own teachers and doctors and, uh, you know, clergy and, you know, oh, I definitely know some imposters in clergy, but, you know, that's a, yes. that's a story for another day. But that is, that is. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, hoping that um, all of ours have been legit. Right. Yeah. So there you go. All righty. Well, this has been our first installment this week for True Crime Paranormal. So hold tight because we'll have a new case coming out on Tuesday, a new case on Wednesday. On Wednesday night, we will have case updates. And oh, you guys, Mark Means is at it again. His <laughs> sure little is. fingers are flying. He's writing as many briefs and filing things as fast as he can go. He is. And rest assured, they are not quality work. But mm, no. We'll get, get into him it. And his client, nowhere, as usual. Yep. Just uh, gobbling up some more Lori's money, I think. Well, Chad's money. Who are we fooling? Yeah. Tammy's money. Who are we fooling? Okay. Yeah. Anyway, we'll get there. And then, of course, Thursday night, the psychic hour. So there's so much more to come this week. And again, if you haven't listened to the Agatha Christie episode, that is uploaded in Patreon. It's a ton of fun. If you want to suggest a case to us, head over to truecrimeparanormalpodcast.com. You can get a reading from either of us. You can shop our merch store. You can request a reading and you can see all of our work. We have quite the body of work. Now we are just about to enter our official second year. We're in our second season, but this is, uh, we're just about to wrap up 12 months. So yeah, sure. very, very excited about everything that's going on around here. So thanks mm -hmm. everyone for listening. Thanks for all of your support. This is True Crime Paranormal with the Psychic Sisters. Take care.